What's it like being a football coach for Brigham Young University, winning a national championship, and having a multiracial family? I got the opportunity to interview Coach Jeff Grimes, the offense coordinator for BYU, and that conversation is coming up. Hey, it's John Finch with The Father Effect. For those of you who may be new to this channel, I wrote a book and made a movie called The Father Effect, and it was in that journey that I learned so much about how I myself could become a better dad. Our mission for this channel is to do the same for you, to help you become a better dad through the advice and stories of others. Before we jump into the interview, don't forget to watch the free movie, The Father Effect, at the link in the upper right hand corner. If you know of another dad that could benefit or may be interested in this conversation I have with Coach Grimes, please make sure to share this video with him. Without further delay, here's my interview with Coach Jeff Grimes. All right, Coach, we're there. How's it going, buddy? It's going good. I see how you're just rubbing it in my face with the background, with the beautiful mountains and scenery. Dude. Yeah, you don't, you don't get that in Dallas, do you? I don't. I don't. But I, hey, I love the Cowboys hat, though. That's a nice, that's a nice uh, little ad, bro. Hey, well, you got to stay true to your roots, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Dude, so mullet, let, let, take off the hat. Let me see the mullet. What, what's going on there? Okay. So I've got, um, I've got four kids, two of which are boys. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of in its formative stages. It's not a great mullet yet. I had a better one back in 1986 or 87 when I was in college, but um, so my oldest boy Garrison is kind of a kind of a free spirit. He's a junior in high school, and he kind of does his own thing. And decided he wanted to do a mullet and, and challenged me to do one with him. And so I, I I jumped in. You know, being being the the uh, the dad who wants to uh, enjoy his time with his kids during this, uh, during this pandemic when we're all shut up at the house anyway. So I said, why not? This is as good a time as any. Dude, I love it, man. I love it. Actually, the sad part about it back when I first met my wife back in 1994, I was actually sporting the mullet with like the curly, like the curly ends on the backs. I was looking we have this conversation all the time. It's like, she's like, I don't know how, I was attracted to you. <laughs> yeah, my wife, my wife was the same thing. I was, I was about three hundred pounds, and and I uh, had a mullet myself. And she said, "Love truly is blind," because I'm not sure what I saw in you then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've grown <laughs> on her. Clearly, clearly, my charm. Yes, I, absolutely. So, dude, let's let's jump in here a little bit. I know. Now, are you originally from Texas, from Garland? Give me that story. I am. Grew up in Garland. uh, Lived in Texas somewhere in the state until I was 30. Um, So went to high school in Garland. Both of my parents are from the Dallas area. Um, Went to college at University of Texas, El Paso. So I spent five years in in, uh, El Paso. And then... um, various other places in the state lived in houston college station abilene um and then uh when i was when i was 30 in the year 2000 um we uh i had the opportunity to to go to uh coach at boise state and my wife and i had never had never left the state of texas and so uh, my wife is from texas too she's from amarillo and she when we first, when I first went into this coaching deal, she said, you know, I'm okay with coaching. I said, you know, we're going to have to move around a bit. She said, well, any of these states here are okay. And so she started pointing on the map to New next, New Mexico and Arkansas and Louisiana, Oklahoma, all the states that touch Texas. And so my first, my first big time coaching job comes in the state of Idaho. We get out a map and she says, Oh my gosh, that borders Canada. (laughs) And I I know, back your stuff, we're going. (laughs) So that's, dude, I love it. Now, tell me the story about how y'all met. uh, So we met through a group called Fellowship of Christian Athletes when we were 
when we were both in college. Uh, she went to Texas A&M, played volleyball there. Truth be told, she's the real athlete in the family. Um, but she went, she went to A&M and, uh, and was involved in FCA there. I was involved. And then we did a couple of different camps, um, a couple of different camps where we were, um, uh, they call them huddle leaders, basically counselors for high school and junior high kids. And we met that way and had a long distance relationship for three years. And this was obviously back before not only cell phones, but before email. This was when you actually had had to use a pay phone or a calling card, or you actually wrote a real letter. And uh, so we got to know each other in a way that, that, that most young folks don't today. We were in a real long distance relationship for three years and uh, never lived in the same town until we got married. You know what? I can say that you've given her some grace too, because anybody that marries an Aggie, oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, I was a, I was a grad assistant there and got my master's degree there as well. So I guess I've been uh, I've been inundated too. Yeah, I had to give that rub to all my Aggie friends. So that, yeah, that I just you know I love getting them st riled up a little bit. Uh, it doesn't take. It doesn't. So connect the dots. You were at UTEP and then kind of walk through your journey as to how you got to where you are now. Wow. Um, so I never planned on getting into coaching. Um, didn't, did, to be honest with you, didn't have much of a plan when I was in college. I uh, really didn't know what, what, what I wanted to do other than, other than play ball and was, was just kind of enjoying my time being, being a young man, playing college football and going to school and got a degree in education, but really kind of got it as something to fall back on, I guess. And, um, in the, so I'll try to make the story, um, somewhat reasonable, but, uh, I got married a year after I graduated from college, tried, tried to make it professionally in a couple of camps, just wasn't good enough to make it. And then realized, okay, I got to be a real person and get a real job. Now and football's done, which can be an identity crisis for a lot of guys. You know, when that when that thing that you've tied yourself to for so long goes away, uh, sometimes it takes a little while to find out who you really are. Um, so for me, um, I just I just didn't really know what I wanted to do for a living. And um, Sherry was finishing up, had a had a year left at Texas A&M and we got married. I lived down there with her for, for a year, got a job just selling advertising just to put food on the table for a year. It was just a job I could find. And then there were some guys that I went to church with in El Paso that ran a corporate insurance company that offered me a job. And, um, you know, these guys were, were doing great. They were, they were making money hand, hand over fist and, um, I didn't have anything else going. And so I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. But we ha had a little bit of time left uh, before she was going to graduate. And so I agreed, in principle to take the job, but had some time left before, before we were going to go. And as, as it got closer and closer to that time, I just, I just didn't feel at peace about it. Didn't feel right about it. And one day I, so I, I told you I was selling advertising. Um, I had this old 77 Chevy blazer that didn't have any air conditioning in it in South Texas in the summertime wearing a suit and tie. You can imagine how that was going over for me. And, one day I was, I was sitting in a railroad crossing, coming back from going out and just making cold calls all day and hating what I'm doing. And um, this train's going by in front of me and I'm watching the sun go down out of the other corner of my eye. And um, I hesitate to say that God spoke to me, but it was as clear a direction as I've ever felt. And the voice in my head said, man, you know, you'd love coaching. And I had really thought that I didn't want to go into coaching because if I ever considered it, I wanted to do it at the college level. And there are so many challenges that go along with that, particularly for a family. So I went home to our little apartment and started talking to Sherry about it. And she just said, you know what? Um, if that's what you want to do and you feel like God's calling you to it, then let's go do it. 
And uh, I said, well, you got to understand what that means. You know, we're going to have to move around a lot. It's going to be a while before I make any money. And um, it's one of those professions where you don't have much job stability. And any given year, you could lose your job. And she said, hey, if you're happy, then we'll be happy. Let's go. And so um, I'm really, really fortunate to have a, a great wife that was so willing to let me pursue pursue my dream. And, uh, and so I, I started out coaching high school football shortly thereafter um, and then was uh, a graduate assistant at a couple of different places and then I coached division three ball at a, at a school in Abilene Hardin Simmons had a great two years there and then uh, got my first big break um, in 2000 as I mentioned before went to Boise State and then been been all over the country since then been as far um, east as Virginia uh, as far south as Alabama and Louisiana and then been out west all up and down the, the Rocky Mountain Range and so I've been blessed and been a lot of been a lot of great places and and uh, it's been a great journey for sure. And coach I know you were at Auburn and there's an interesting story there kind of kind of tell that story piece it together for people. Yeah so I so um, I was I was really fortunate I didn't know um, anyone closely at Auburn. Gene Chizik had just taken the job in 2009. I was coaching at University of Colorado at the time. And um, one of the coaches on the staff mentioned my name to him. And um, Gus Malzahn at the time was the offensive coordinator. And he and I had met briefly. And so they they interviewed me for the job. And, and uh, I fooled them into thinking I was a pretty good coach. And so they hired me. And so we were there four years, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it was a great experience, every bit of it, you know, and there were, there were some real um, incredible memories that were made. Obviously, in 2010, we won the national championship, which was an incredible thing for, for me and my family to be a part of, um, something that you, that you certainly uh, dream about in this profession. Um, but there were a couple of other things that happened that, that really have stuck with me a lot, a lot more um, significantly. Um, and the first that I remember was shortly after that year, there was one of the guys that I coached who was a senior and he had been off somewhere training. And this was a kid who had been, uh, who had had a successful career, a great kid, but it had some bumps in the road along the way. And, uh, didn't didn't have a dad, and since since we're uh, going to talk about being a dad, I, I just felt like this was a, a, a kind of a cool story to share. But this guy had been off training, getting ready for his NFL pro day, and he came back in town, and and uh, I saw him briefly, but he left a note on my desk and said a bunch of things in it. But at the very end of it, he said, "Coach, you're like the dad I never had, and if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be where I am today." And got a little tear in my eye and I looked, looked over to my left and that national championship ring was sitting there in my office and the thought just ran across my mind, you know, that's infinitely more important than any ring that you could ever have. Cause in a couple of years, nobody's going to care about that ring or, or who won the national championship or even know that you were on that staff. And sure enough, two years later, we go three and nine and uh, we all get fired, you know, in this business, when they fire the head coach, we all get fired. And so I lost my job then. And uh, really about midway through the season, I, I could see it coming. I think we all felt like that was a possibility. And so started talking to my wife about it. And we really started uh, having conversations about what this would mean for us and our family. And uh, our, our kids were fairly young at the time. Um, my oldest daughter Bailey was probably 12 and uh, boys um, nine and seven and then uh, our youngest daughter was was young enough that she wouldn't really know what was going on just three but I, I mentioned to my wife I think I think we need to let them in on this and start talking to them about what could happen here and she was hesitant at first because she wanted to kind of protect them from that you know when when dad starts um, worrying about his job, then kids start worrying about that too and maybe getting teased at school and having to deal with 
why your why your dad's such a bad coach and y'all are going to get fired and all of that but i just said you know we're we're growing through this god's using this thing to grow our faith and we shouldn't rob them of that same opportunity and so we talked to them about it and let them walk through that journey with us and um sure enough we did get fired and i went for a couple of months without without a job and not only without a job, without a prospect of a job, without a phone call or anything for a couple of months. Um, but I'll tell you, I learned a whole lot more during that time than I did in 2010 when we won the national championship. And hopefully someday if, if, uh, if my daughter's ever in that situation and her husband loses his job, I hope she'll say, you know what, I remember when that happened to my daddy. And let me tell you how we handled it. And if it happens to my boys, I hope they'll be able to, to walk through it and say, you know what, God took care of us then in, in our family, and this will be fine too. Dude, what a great story of faith and the legacy that that leaves, that you're leaving for your kids and, and the generation that that's going to impact. I, as, as a young man growing up without a father, you know, coaches were such a huge impact for me. I, I just was drawn to coaches, to other men, that, because I didn't have that father. And I could just, I mean, I was just soaking everything up, everything about him. I was trying to figure out, you know, what does that look like to be a man? And what can I take from that guy and that guy? And so I know the influence coaches have. What opportunities from that standpoint does coaching give you to really, you're, you're fathering a lot of kids beyond your own. I mean, just year after year after year, right? The influence that you have. Yeah, I think so. I think as a coach, we're we're in a position to have a greater amount of influence than than a lot of people, and that's a um, that's a great responsibility. And I think in in the profession now, it's lost a little bit of its of its value and its um, um, integrity because there's a lot of money and fame and popularity that can go along with college and professional coaching and so i think some people have gotten into it for the wrong reasons some guys um, aspire to some of the things that aren't really maybe why they got into the business and and i'm not saying that i'm above that certainly we we all can fall prey to things that are maybe less important but a little bit more um, shiny and glamorous um, but at the same time I think most of us would say we got into this business to make an impact and that impact is there every single day um, the, the opportunity to have an impact on on a guy and, and I think the opportunity is there because you have something that they want you know whether that be playing time or knowledge of the game or the ability to help them get to the NFL, the opportunity to, to help them fulfill a dream and become a great college football player. Those things are, uh, are big, meaningful things in life for an 18 to 22 year old man. And so the chance to do that is, is an opportunity to grab them when you really have their attention. And it's something that I don't take lightly. Um, and certainly I, I wish I could do a better job than I do sometimes. Um, and there's a challenge in that, just like there is in, in raising my own children. Um, but that, that opportunity is there every single day that I show up to work. And, and that's one of the things that I really feel, feel blessed by. I have, I have the opportunity to do something that, that not only I love, but hopefully can, can leave a lasting impact. And, you know, there are a lot of guys, as you mentioned, who grow up without dads or without a good dad. And... I hope that my role can be one that's maybe a substitute father in some sense, but also one of the things that I, that I try to do is have the guys over to my house, have my family around them, and hopefully they see what a family can be like if it's done the way that, that, um, that God designed for it to be. Not that, not that mine's just right, um, but we try. And hopefully that gives them a picture of something that they aspire to someday but the other thing too i'll say is that even guys who do have good dads they're still in position during this phase of life where they're where they're growing and learning and maturing and i know i know the, the coaches and and men who were involved in uh in my life during those college years some of the guys who were involved with fellowship of christian athletes and my church guys that that really mentored me during that time 
had a huge impact on me, even though I had a good dad. And so, um, it is, it is something that, um, that I feel really blessed to have the opportunity to do. Brother, I, I love to the idea and what you're talking about to, for our kids and your players to see you fail and overcome failure, what that looks like, right? Because even that, for them to see the example of you going through hard times and overcoming it and what that looks like, because that's, you know, good dad, bad dad, whatever. That is such a valuable lesson because all of us are going to have those times where, man, life gets really tough and it's just so important for them to see you overcome it, right? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, certainly, I, I, I make I make my mistakes as a dad and as a coach. And um, it, one of the things that I think is a challenge for me sometimes is trying to figure out where that where that line is between um, trying to be the right kind of example and being vulnerable enough to be real and authentic at the same time. That's that's something that I sometimes uh, battle with, to be honest with you. And you know what? I can imagine being in a position that you're in, it, that it, the struggle of what that looks like and balancing that to where you have a positive impact in both ways. Um, dude, I love just the authenticity and, and just your openness to have these conversations. As far as a dad is concerned, what's been your biggest struggle as a father and how did you overcome it? Um. I think I think the hardest thing for me as a dad is not not being able to control things sometimes the way that I would like to or the way that I think needs to be done and I don't know if any it, it certainly has something to do with with maybe my personality also maybe what I do as as a coach what I do for a living I'm used to being in position where I can where I can make a difference, I can control things, I can, I can schedule a practice, I can um, um, motivate a player, I can, uh, I can call a certain play, I can do things that have an impact on a season or on a game, and, and I have a large degree of, of control. Um, a challenge for me sometimes is, is in a little bit different role at home when, I, when, I, when I'm not able to get things done the way that I would like to or when one of my kids doesn't behave in a way that I think they should be. Um, I'm not always as patient as I ought to be. I'm not as understanding as I could be. And, and, and walking that line between being a consistent disciplinarian and and helping them become their best version of themselves and, and becoming what I see they can become, reaching their potential, yet at the same time, making sure they know I love them enough. That, that's probably the hardest thing for me, um, just walking, again, walking that line, that balance between those two things. And, and um, I probably fall on the side of, of not being compassionate enough at times. And, you're, the second part of your question, I, I don't think I have overcome it yet. I think it's something that I'm, that I'm working on uh, daily. You know, it, it's a struggle. I have three daughters, and I hear you, and I think so many men can identify with that because we're competitive, and it is the control. You want to have control of things. <laughs> Sometimes God has a funny way of testing our patience and our trust and our faith, right? Growing in it. But like my girls, I have to rely on my wife a lot because I have that tendency to be that over the top. Like, you you know, sometimes I'm pushing a little too much because I'm just thinking that's the way I would <laughs> deal with me. <laughs> but it's when it's three girls, it's just a different ball game. So um, when you were at LSU, tell me who was the head coach there? So Les Miles hired me in um, 2014, and so I was with him there two two years and a little bit more, and then he got fired midway through the following season. I guess my third year there, and then and then uh, Ed Orgeron took over. He was on the staff as the defensive line coach, and then he took over as the interim head coach for my third year and then I was with him one more year um, when he when he had become the full-time head coach 
I had to ask uh, my in-laws, my wife's from the Baton Rouge area. So, you know, I had to, had to find out a little bit more about the LSU story. Cause you'd be in trouble if you didn't at least I'd, mention that. I would be, I'd be sleeping on the couch tonight. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Those, those cages don't, don't overlook that sort of thing real easily. They don't play around, but it's the best food and some of the best people in the world. Right. Wow. My wife and I were just talking today about we need to get some gumbo or jambalaya or etouffee. I miss it. Yeah. Now, I know you have an adopted daughter, right? Kind of tell me that story. We do. Um, so we have three biological children. Um, and it, it, it's an interesting story. Uh, my wife and I uh, never, never talked about adopting. And before we started having our biological children before we had our, our first child, we had been, we had been off on vacation and um, we were kind of getting to that point in life where we were, where we were close to, to getting ready to start our family. And um, I, it was something that I'd kind of been thinking about for a little while, but really one day we're sitting in an airport and, and the thought just struck my mind. Okay. I, yeah, this is something I, I feel like I should do, not just that I want to do. And, so I looked at Sherry and I said, you know what? I think someday I'd like to adopt a kid. And she goes, no way, me too. And I said, wow, um, and I really think it should be a child of another race. And she goes, no way, me too. <laughs> and so without us even having ever talked about it, God kind of planted that idea in both of our minds and hearts. And so it was something that we always knew that we would do. And, and so we went through the next few years, had three kids and then, um, began the process of um, praying about and trying to decide where and when and all of that and and decided that we would adopt a little girl from Ethiopia and so uh, we we uh, worked through a group called Children's Hope International and uh, you know there's just an amazing work that that uh, adoption agencies do um, and just seeing the need was something that um, that I that I won't forget, and and I recognized it before because I had seen the staggering numbers of how many orphans there are worldwide, and 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 certainly there are there are huge needs here in the U.S. Um, but when you travel to uh, a place like Ethiopia and you see uh, the situations that some people are in, um, it just opens your eyes to to a whole new world literally and so we uh we were we were matched with uh with our daughter when she was four months old and then you have to go through the paperwork and it took us four more months until uh, the courts cleared us to do the travel and we we traveled over there and we were i think we were in country for for nine days in ethiopia and and uh, got to experience the the country and the culture and and got to know our little girl at that time and, and then brought her back with us. And she's 10 now, and um, she's been a bigger blessing to us than we've been to her. You know what I was just fixing to say? She's probably taught you more about life and love and everything else than you could have ever taught her, huh? Yeah, for sure. I think for sure, I mean, and, and not, just, um, not just my wife and I, but our kids too, and what it's done for our entire family. And, and I think the way it allows you to look at the world a little bit differently when you have a multiracial family, you know, and um, I think I grew up in a time and a place where um, prejudice and prejudice and racism um, was, was more rampant than it is now. And it certainly hasn't been eradicated um, in our country yet. Um, but at the time it was even more significant. And I think um, it certainly has, has opened our eyes to even to even more things and how it's still um, alive within our country and within the world. And um, certainly that wasn't our primary motive, but I think um, one of the things that it's allowed us to do is is see things a little bit more clearly from another vantage point. Wow, I know you know, it's such chaotic and stressful times right now and lives are being turned upside down. And this pandemic is just, it's, you know, causing so much stress. What has it allowed you to do from a father perspective with your kids? Yeah, it's, it's really been great. Um, at first, to be honest with you, I, I had a little bit of a struggle with it. We were right in the middle of spring ball 
we had we had practiced six practices we get 15 in the spring and we were getting ready for our seventh practice and i'm sitting there with my staff looking at the practice plan and we keep seeing about every five minutes something else gets canceled and i just we we looked at each other and said i don't think that's going to happen and then uh for a few days it was hard on me to kind of figure out how to how to reorient myself you know so much of my time is and focus is spent on on what i do um at work that it was a challenge to to recognize i was going to lose that at least to some extent for a while and then uh something that kind of puts it puts it all in perspective i have a coach a small group and uh we were meeting not long ago and and my pastor who's also my best friend um, said, you know what, you're always talking about how your kids are growing up too fast and you just wish that life could slow down a little bit. Here you go. And so what a blessing it, it really has been, you know, having, having teenagers in the house, um, you know how challenging it is to even have a meal together, much less several meals together. And now we have almost all of our meals together. And, you know, in the beginning, i I said, okay, we got to establish some sort of routine here. You know, the first challenge was helping my teenage boys realize that this just wasn't perpetual spring break. You know, they thought, okay, <laughs> that means we can stay up as late as we want and uh, sleep in as late as we want. Whenever we get to school, we'll get to school. Um, but um, the coach in me came out pretty early on and I said, no, we got to get some structure here. So, so we set a time to get up and had breakfast and morning devotional together and then and then got on school work and of course they're doing online school like everybody else is and then had had a time where everybody was was going to work out and try to keep ourselves healthy and um and then have lunch together and then everybody kind of did their own thing for a while in the afternoon and come back together for dinner and you know it's given us time to just sit around and play uno and uh watch shows and do things together that that we haven't been doing it, at least not to that extent. And so um, it's given me an opportunity to, to rub up next to, to my family on a more consistent basis than I have in a while. Uh, I think the real challenge now would be when that has to go away. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's been a challenge for me as, as a dad um, is, is to be the kind of husband and father that I want to be yet still be, uh, a successful coach and and so I'll, I'll have to get back to navigating those waters whenever whenever life goes back to to normal you know and I've I've been very fortunate we've interviewed several college, co college coaches as of lately and just the struggle of work life balance and I know even outside coaching my own struggle in the corporate world or doesn't matter what you do from a man's perspective, it's trying to keep that in balance. And it's so tough to do sometimes because you get so caught up and, and driven in the success and the wins and all the other stuff that, you know, we lose focus of what's most important. And what's so cool about this time is I think it's really helped all of us understand, wow, this is what's really important. This is what really counts, right? Yeah, no question it has. And like I said, I just hope when things go back to normal or whatever our new normal is, um, I hope maybe that some of that'll some of that'll stick with us. And I've always I've always believed that you can be a successful coach and be a good husband and a good daddy too, but you have to make it a priority. And again, I haven't been perfect at that, but I I decided early on in in my life as a dad that I wasn't going to have a lot of hobbies, you know? So one of my guys said, Hey, you got to learn how to play golf. And I said, Nope, not, not until I'm done raising kids. Maybe then I will, but I'm, I'm not going to, and I don't fault anybody who does, but I just wasn't going to take the time to learn something new while I had kids in the house. And so um, for me, you know, it's, it's really, life's really simple. It's about, it's about faith, my family and football. And, um, and if you if you do make it a priority, you can have all of those things and you can be a good coach or a good salesman or a good CEO or a good um, surgeon, I think, whatever you choose to do and be a good family man, too. 
but you got to really set out to do it. It's not just going to happen because I think so many of us are so driven that it's easy to put in another hour at work. It's easy to be absent emotionally at home um, when, when you got something going on at work that, that requires your attention. It's, it's hard sometimes to shut those things off. Um, but I really, really believe you can do it if you're intentional about it. Dude, you know, to what I love is just the, the idea, because I think men out there need to hear, and I preach this and just over and over again, none of us are perfect, man. All of us are jacked up, have our own junk and our stuff. And, and understanding that is, I know at least for me early on, when, when God was kind of taking me through this journey, understanding that I wasn't the only messed up guy and that I thought everybody else had it figured out. And I was the only one that didn't. But, but knowing that we're all just, you know, trying to do this thing together <laughs> and, and failing. I'm failing all the time, continue to fail, but, but thankful for God's grace. And the, and the kids, my kids, they give me grace too. So, uh, dude, tell me as we wrap up, what's the best thing about being a dad? Um, just, just having that, um, that relationship that, that means, that means so much, you know, and, and I love what I do. I, I love coaching. I love football, but not like I love my wife and my kids. And, um, the, um, the emotional connection that I have to them and what they mean to me, um, is more than, than any win that I could ever experience on the football field. And, and it's not even close. And they give me more, more joy and love than, than anything else in the world. Amen, bro. If you've got a dad, new father sitting in front of you and he says, Hey coach, give me one piece of advice. That's going to be a game changer. What would you tell him? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you can give more than one if you want. Okay. But. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, I'd say love your wife. Um, have a great relationship with your wife and don't stop dating her. My wife and I still, uh, not now, obviously, but we spend plenty of time together, but we go out a lot. Um, we, we go off on our own a couple of times a year. We'll have a weekend or a week away. And um, my kids know what it looks like to be, to be raised in a home where mom and dad love each other and, and they enjoy being in each other's company. And, you know, we've said several times during this whole pandemic, man, this would be tough if we didn't like each other. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I feel, I feel blessed to be in a, in a marriage. We're coming up on 28 years this summer um, where, where my wife and I still live, love each other and love being around each other. Um, and so I, I'd start with that because I think it gives them, I hope it gives them, uh, a certain amount of stability in life and, and uh, gives them a picture of what a marriage is supposed to look like. And really that's where family starts. And then I would just um, reiterate some of the things that we just talked about in terms of being willing to do what it takes to be a good dad at the expense of what it might take to be a good dentist or coach. Um, because there are lots of people who can do, do those things well. <laughs> Uh, but at the end of it all, the relationship that you have with your kids is going to, is going to be infinitely more important. Um, and then, uh, I think don't, don't be afraid, um, to be consistent in your discipline, um, as long as they know that you love them. And an old coach, when I was at Auburn, Pat Dye used to be coach there, great man, great coach. He used to come by my office every other week or so, and he'd sit down and put his boots up on the desk and talk with me. And one of the things he used to say all the time is you can coach them just as hard as you're willing to love them. And I think that's true in coaching. I think it's true in parenting too. I think we can be demanding and, and expect the best of them because nobody expects more of my kids in this whole world than I do. As long as they know that nobody loves them more than I do either. I love it, Coach, man. And I greatly appreciate you, brother. I know you're busy and got a lot going on. And uh, we're going to have to have another conversation at some point. But you're not going to have to be outside with all that beautiful background and making me mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
it's a beautiful place, but I'm a still Texas, just still a Texas boy at heart. Hey, dude. I uh, I love it, man. One of these days, I'm going to make it up there to to to, uh, to Utah. I love that state. I've been up there a couple of times, but I don't think I've been up there in the summer. And so uh, it's I'm looking forward to being up there at some point here over the next few years. Good luck this this next season, Coach, and and we'll definitely stay connected. I appreciate you. Thanks. Appreciate everything that you're doing. You're making an impact in the world, and appreciate what you're doing. Before you go, make sure you check out the Father Effect Show, where I have interviewed some fascinating, influential, and sometimes ordinary people with extraordinary stories. And remember, your life is your legacy, and what you do and say every day is impacting your family and the generations to come. See you next time on the Father Effect Show.